Thank you, Bill. Uh, it's an honor for me to be on this uh, platform with these other speakers who have preceded me. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different because a lot of the ground has already been covered. Uh, I'll tell you two sentences about myself to explain this front slide. I'm a retired Chicago police homicide detective. <laughs> I spent 25 years investigating uh, violent crimes on the south side of Chicago out of my 31-year police career. And people will always ask, well, what is the difference between being an historian and a detective? And I tell them, not much. <laughs> because basically, it's the same job. Uh, I spent almost as much time uh, writing history, Civil War history, as I did writing Chicago Police homicide supplementary reports that I would then use in court. So I've been a professional writer most of my life, uh, but not a professional historian. Although in my last few years before I retired, I was accused of, of using detective work as my part-time job because doing things like this was my real job. Uh, the difference between some of uh, what a, uh, a modern detective does and what a historian does, especially researching the Civil War period, uh, you're looking for the same things. You're looking for evidence. Well, what is evidence? At a, at a, as a, a crime scene, we have a battlefield as a corollary. For witnesses, we have the testimony of Civil War era people in their letters, diaries, and official documents. I had it in the form of actual people I could interview. The benefit to doing historical research is that the witnesses don't change their stories. <laughs> <laughs> now, that doesn't mean they told the truth up front, because usually I tell people, let's, I don't have a lot of time. Let's skip the first two lies and get on to the third one. Uh, it, what they wrote down might not be the truth, but at least it ain't going to change overnight, or especially not at the critical moment when they're being sworn in to tell their version. And I hate that concept of the truth, because to me the truth is only one thing, uh, not a lie. <laughs> so these are the similarities. Uh, an historian is trying to do the same thing a detective is doing. A detective is making a case, but not to make a case from a predisposed uh, position. It's taking all this evidence, all these facts, all these uh, witnesses, uh, artifacts are, are evidence. They pick up shell casings at a crime scene. A cannonball on a battlefield is really no different except in scale. Uh, and what you're trying to do is find out just what the heck happened here. How did it go down? Who are the players? What did they do? And what does it mean? And I think that's what historians do. Now, if you're doing history and you've already made up your mind that that uh, person A is the worst person that ever existed, or that he was the greatest saint since Jesus Christ, uh, then you're not doing history. You're, you're doing something from a fixed position. So the key to both history, in my opinion, and detective work, in my experience, is to get to the truth, no matter where it takes you, whether or not you like where it goes. But just what the heck is history? Now, if you ask any of these three men, you'll get three very different answers. Napoleon, the guy in the middle, said that history is a set of agreed-upon lies. <laughs> Ambrose Bierce, the gentleman on the upper right, wrote, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the Devil's Dictionary, uh, history is an account, mostly false, of events, mostly unimportant, that are brought about by rulers, mostly knaves, and soldiers, mostly fools. And then, of course, there's Mark Twain. The very ink with which all history is written is merely fluid prejudice. Well, that was the thing I was addressing a moment ago. Is it or isn't it? Did this or didn't this happen in the way that we're being told it was? Now, the reason that the Abraham Lincoln isn't pictured here is because I couldn't find a source where this quote uh, came from him. But we have a, a, a Lincoln source here, so you can tell me if this is or is not Lincoln. So that's your homework. Uh, history is not history until less it is the truth. Are you familiar with that? Herndon, okay. Or an attribution? Okay. Well, that's why his picture's not there, because I don't want to make Lincoln say, honest Abe can't say something wrong because Detective Girardi said so. And, and that's one thing you learn as a detective. Never tell somebody what happened. Ask them what happened. And then if, it's, if their answer isn't quite... They say, well, now let me ask you again in English. Because otherwise... Some officer would tell you, well, Detective Girardi told me to say that. 
And that ain't going down on paper anywhere, because I never did it. <laughs> so anyway, what is the truth, and how do we come to a determination of what is truth, and how good is this evidence that we're using to make our case, whether criminal or historical, and I hope those two things are, not, are mutually exclusive. My personal belief is that history is the story of the past as we understand it based on the best available evidence and the interpretation of that evidence. Uh, and that's uh, the people of the past. And, and it, we base our, uh, uh, our learning based on their creations, the things they did, their deeds, and their legacies. What did they leave behind for us? What did they want us to know about themselves? Because that's part of the story, although that part might not be true. Our quest to understand uh, feeds our need. Our, our quest to understand ourselves comes from understanding where we came from. Who were these people of the past? What did history mean to them? What did they mean to themselves, and where did they fit into the picture of their lives in the time they lived? I think it's foolish to try to judge people of the past in terms of our experience of the present. I think that's the, the beginning of going down the foolishness rabbit hole. Uh, it's also important in a criminal investigation as well as in a historical investigation not to prejudge. Don't assume you know what happened. Nothing is ever as it seems, especially on a crime scene. You take that evidence, you try to piece it together, you might have a puzzle, everybody here's done a jigsaw puzzle, sometimes you only have 90 pieces out of the 100 piece puzzle. So you know what happened, you know what the picture is, but you don't know what those missing pieces are, and sometimes it can change, it can change your view, especially if the missing pieces are of Booth holding the gun. <laughs> I mean, you can presume what happened, but it, it's not the same thing as actually seeing it. So we can't prejudge our cases. We can't manipulate the facts or cherry pick them to force our argument. After all, we're historians, not lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kurt didn't leave. <laughs> and Mark. <laughs> Whether we ever know the truth of history is dependent on the amount of investigating we do and the credibility of the evidence that we find. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in here, but this mirrors uh, uh, your slide, Michelle, early on. Well, it's almost exactly the same, the same sort of iconography on there. We have Civil War artifacts. Artifacts are things. They're not, they're not things alone, though. These are not just uh, witnesses to history. They're participants in history. A partially exploded cannonball was there. A uniform with a bullet hole and bloodstains in it is, it was in the battle. It was something that's important, something that we can, it can help us understand what happened. You have photographs of the soldiers. We've just seen a number of them. This is just one, but that's a snapshot in time of a real human being, the way he appeared at that date and time. So it truly and accurately depicts Lyman Summer Hall Whitney at the date and time that that photograph was taken. Then we have their letters. Letters are probably, in my opinion, the single best, second single best source of primary evidence from the battlefield. Because soldiers wrote, usually to somebody near and dear to them, and they were gonna tell you a story, and they had no agenda to make something up. I'll come back to that in a second. Diaries are better because you're writing to yourself, and you can lie to mommy and daddy and your girlfriend, but you can't lie to yourself. So usually the best sources are in the diary, unless it's just a travel log, March 10 miles rained, or lent 25 cents to Joe, <laughs> or something like that. But if sometimes when they're fleshed out and there's actually a story in there, to me, that's gold. The letters are different because a friend of mine has letters of a soldier in the 7th Illinois Cavalry written during the raid. Uh, during Grierson's raid on letterhead from Newton Station. And it wasn't John Wayne who wrote the letters. It, it was a soldier in the 7th Illinois Cavalry, and he wrote a letter home detailing the events of the raid to his mother and father. And then he wrote a letter detailing the same events to his brother. And they're wildly different letters. <laughs> so both are true, but one is more true because he self-edited what he wanted his parents to know. And so that's, that's my caveat, because I know a lot of witnesses who you ask them something, and, and at the end of a very long 40-hour day, they tell you, you ask them something, and all of a sudden they spill something that if they had told you 38 and a half hours ago, would have made your day a lot shorter. And you say, well, why didn't you tell me that? Well, you didn't ask me all that. <laughs> 
So even though it was useful to me, they weren't going to tell me unless I specifically asked for that nugget. And so sometimes, as in a story, you have to find that nugget. I already mentioned the battlefields. I have their corollary as uh, crime scenes. If you write about a battle and you don't know where certain things are geographically in relation to one another, or what the terrain looks like, or now when you go, there's trees where trees should not be because they weren't there then, uh, you get a much different understanding of what happened. We had a dispatcher in our office who would say, well, there's really no crime scene per se, so you don't have to go there. I went to the crime scene, even if I knew that every second counted, because if I didn't get to Cook County Hospital before they, they sedated my victim, it might be two weeks or never before I could talk to him. But I always went to the crime scene, because when he told me it was by the red building on the corner, I wanted to know which building he was talking about, so that my next questions could make sense. And so these are the kinds of things that we learn from the artifacts, but by also asking the right questions. But one way to ask the right questions is to know what those questions should be and what this witness or what this evidence is capable or should be capable of revealing to you. Many, many years ago, uh, I encountered this book, The Historian as Detective. And this book is an anthology. It's a bunch of essays on historical events and in some criminal cases even, where evidence was used to make or break a case, and sometimes how evidence is misapplied to falsely make a case. And I always thought that was an interesting idea. And then, even though I've been a Civil War uh, student my whole life from I can't remember when, when I wasn't, uh, and I was building up my own research library at home, it always intrigued me of the uses of evidence. And so I started looking for better and better sources to do my own work upon. And then Santa Claus came and made me a detective. So ever since that day in 1992, I wanted to do a program or something on the detective as historian, because I found that overlap was always there. So this is an interesting book uh, to look at if you want to see some of the uses and misuses of historical evidence in telling a story. Uh, I think it's a useful de demonstration of what we've all been talking about today. So the main source of a lot of research is libraries and archives. This is my library and archive. Uh, before I tidied it up, I didn't realize this was the picture I had selected. But this is only a very small fraction of my library, which consists of about 8,000 Civil War books. Uh, and, and not to mention uh, many, unfortunately, I didn't know Griff. Uh, <laughs> I have probably, I don't want to make up a number, but hundreds and hundreds of Civil War letters only about a third of which are transcribed, because I usually have something else to do. Uh, but I'm going to limit my remarks today mostly to my own experience and my own opinions on things, but using representative examples to try to illustrate my point. This is the building block of any uh, historical research. Before you get to the letters and the diaries and the archives and things, you've got to know the background. You have to know what it is you're looking for, where it fits into the bigger picture, and then go down and zero in, zero in, zero in. My philosophy as an historian was like it was as a detective, always look under one more rock. <laughs> the problem is you get to the point where now you're in a rock garden and somebody's telling you, I want your report. <laughs> so you have to make sure that, that even with the stuff that you know you have to exclude, you already have enough relevant things to tell your story. And this is the background. When I started putting my library together about 40 years ago, I wanted the best sources that were available, as many primary sources in book form, which means published letters, diaries, journals, memoirs, official documents, et cetera, to, to be able to tell the story. And I wanted to have something on every subject so that at least I had a starting point. And then I have a whole bookcase full of finding aids so that I made somebody at the National Archives angry because when he was giving me the orientation, I was handing in my requisition slips so because I've already done the homework at home. And he didn't, he didn't like that. That see, seemed to me I was doing him a favor. He had an extra 10 minutes for coffee, but uh, that, that wasn't it. Well, primary sources as books can also be, uh, can also be problematical. I went to the uh, Philadelphia uh, State, I mean, the Pennsylvania State Archives in Philadelphia to look for something in the George Gordon Mead papers. And uh, George Gordon Mead's son wrote a two-volume history, The Life and Letters of George Gordon Mead. And I was going there to look for some other documentation because I hadn't found it anywhere, but I wanted to see what else was and wasn't in Mead's papers to find out what he considered or what his family considered to be important. Well, there, there is one episode where 
In the Battle of Spotsylvania, when General John Sedgwick is killed, he's replaced by uh, Major General Horatio Wright. And in the, the edited version of the books, George uh, Meade is writing in a letter home to his wife that Sedgwick is dead and I'm replacing him with Wright, who's the most capable officer, uh, and, you know, and a fine, upstanding individual, whatever. The problem was, in the original letters, it says, but he is not independent, he's not aggressive, and he needs to be, basically, he needs to be micromanaged. That's not in the books. So the books are, you have to know where you're walking because there could be minefields, and I see some nodding heads. Well, this is the basic building block of uh, Civil War research. But let me tell you that, that the people of the Civil War realized that they were doing something important and that it was important to document it. So during the war, Frank Moore started, he was a newspaper man, he started compiling a record of all the important letters and documents and newspaper stories and other accounts of, of things that were going on. And he started publishing, uh, ended up being 12 volumes of the Rebellion Record. And it's a real time. Uh, if you will, accessioning of important Civil War documents and, and, and paperwork, which was used before the official records came out as the, the go-to source to find out what the, what the heck just happened. Uh, but the official records uh, supplanted that, but I still recommend people would go to the rebellion records. Well, the official records, or as it's formally titled, War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate armies in the War of the Rebellion in just 128 volumes. Uh, <laughs> and also uh, the, the companion set of the official records of the navies, Union and Confederate. And then more recently, like in, within the last 20 years, an additional supplemental volumes to the official records, another 100 volumes, uh, which includes a lot of reports that didn't make it into the official records including some of the Confederate sources that uh, Confederate, uh, the war's over, some Confederate officers or individuals had letters and reports that never got submitted, and they weren't giving it to that Yankee government. But they gave a lot of it to the Southern Historical Society. And some of those reports were published in the 52 volumes of the Southern Historical Society papers. Those reports aren't in the official records. Most of them are now in the supplement to the official record. But anyway, this is the basic building block of Civil War research before you get to the archives and other sources. Uh, by the time the Civil War ended, Union war records filled a four-story building and about a third of the War Department building in Washington. Confederate records filled an additional three-story building. And between 1881 and 1901, 23 different editors went through this mountain or mountain range of papers and organized them and, and figured out, well, this is important and this isn't as important, so we're going to use this and we're not going to use that. And so they cherry-picked a lot of things. So a lot of what they had didn't get in. So when you go to those 128 volumes, maybe you should think there was another 100 volumes printed. There's probably another 150 volumes worth of stuff that still isn't published. So you still have to go to the manuscript uh, lady or to the archive lady or to, to the expert on transcriptions and, and find out the rest, because there's always more. And the piece that you don't use is the one you wish you had. <laughs> so that, that's part of it. Well, this was the official records, but as I've said, it's incomplete, it's been cherry-picked, and so it's not the gospel. It's the gospel according to the War Department on what they wanted you to know or what they thought was important for you to know about the Civil War. In 1882, this, this is Walt Whitman, uh, Civil War nurse and poet, and uh, uh, this quote from him uh, sparked my interest always, since I was always a book guy. I used to save my high school lunch money to buy Civil War books. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is his quote, and I'll, I'll give you the whole quote. It's a little long, so bear with me. He, this is what Walt Whitman writes. Future years will never know the seething hell and black infernal background of countless minor scenes and interiors, not the official surface courteousness of the generals, not the few great battles of the secession war, and it is best they should not. The real war will never get into the books. In the mushy influences of current times, too, the fervid atmosphere and typical events of those years are in danger of being totally forgotten. Well, that's more than 140 years ago when he said that. I have at night watched by the side of a sick man in the hospital, one who could not live many hours. 
I have seen his eyes flash and burn as he raised himself and recurred to the cruelties on his surrendered brother and the mutilations of the corpse afterward. Such was the war. It was not a quadrille in a ballroom. Its interior history will, never only, will, on, will not only never be written, in practicality, in minutia of deeds and passions, will never even be suggested. The actual soldier of 1861-65, north and south, with all his ways, his incredible dauntlessness, habits, practices, tastes, language, his fierce friendship, his appetite, rankness, his superb strength and animality, lawless gait, and a hundred unnamed lights and shades of camp, I say, will never be written, perhaps must not be, and should not be written. Well, that's food for thought when you're using what they write as your bread and butter. Was Walt Whitman right? Well, maybe. But let's take a look at some of the primary sources uh, that are available to us and see what, what they reveal. The gentleman pictured here is, uh, became Major General John Eugene Smith. He was uh, from Galena, Illinois. He's one of the Galena Nine, uh, and, and that's not a, a criminal group, mostly. Uh, <laughs> But he's a guy that gets U.S. Grant into the war at the beginning of the war. In 1860, January, after Richard Yates gets installed as governor, John Smith becomes the military adjutant to the governor, uh, and he's responsible for putting together the first uh, units uh, when war breaks out. Uh, he becomes Colonel of 45th Illinois, the Lead Mine Regiment, and makes his way into Grant's command. After he got Grant into the Army, he's assigned to Grant's Army. And he fights at Fort Donelson and at Shiloh. The picture here is against the backdrop, famous backdrop of Shiloh. In a letter to his wife uh, about the Battle of Fort Donelson, Smith writes this. I believe, I believe I dodged once when a shell whistled so close that I thought I felt the wind. It is strange that a person can be so indifferent when men are being shot down. My only solicitude was for the men. And now he talks about Jasper Maltby, another one of the Galena generals who's in his Regiment. Maltby, I do not think, would let out a fart without first ascertaining if there was somebody ready to smell it. <laughs> the day he was wounded, he flourished his sword and exclaimed, Give him help, boys, I am wounded, and leaned upon his sword as though to keep from falling, and afterward walked off the field. He does everything for effect. Now, that's a piece of history that tells you his measure of the man that's serving under him, one of, his, one of his guys. And you can't make this stuff up. This is what he means. He's writing to his wife. Who's she going to tell? Certainly not Mrs. Maltby. Uh, <laughs> but at the Battle of Shiloh, after the Battle of Shiloh, he wrote to Congressman Elihu B. Washburn. Now, Washburn uh, and was a, a 